Hi, this is Miss Rachel with another First Chapter Friday. Today we're going to be looking at Julie of the Wood Wolves by Jean Craighead George, read with permission from HarperCollins. Um, this is like an oldie but goodie. It's won a whole bunch of awards. It was one of my favorites when I was younger. Um, and it's about a girl named Mia. And she lives in Alaska. She's an Inuit Indian Eskimo. And she is in, arranged to be married, and she's only 13. So she kind of freaks out, and she doesn't want to do that. So she decides to run away to live with her pen pal who lives in San Francisco. But she runs away by actually running away across the Alaskan wilderness. And there's, like, nothing there, and it's freezing, and she has to survive. And she's not surviving very well. And she comes um, into contact with a pack of wolves who kind of adopt her and take care of her. Um, but she has to act like a wolf to be kind of um, taken in by them. So she walks on all fours, and she develops a really close relationship with the little pup called Kapu. Um, and this is about their journey and what she learns about herself in survival. And she's remembering everything that her father taught her about surviving in the wild. And as far as she knows, he is, uh, died while he was away at sea. Um, so this is how all of their stories intertwine. Part 1. Amarak, the Wolf Mia pushed back the hood of her sealskin parka and looked at the arctic sun. It was a yellow disc in a lime green sky, the color of six o'clock in the evening and the time when the wolves awoke. Quietly she put down her cooking pot and crept to the top of a dome-shaped frost heave, one of the many earth buckles that rise and fall in the crackling cold of the arctic winter. Lying on her stomach, she looked across a vast lawn of grass and moss and focused her attention on the wolves she had come upon two sleeps ago. They were wagging their tails as they awoke and saw each other. Her hands trembled and her heartbeat quickened, for she was frightened, not so much of the wolves, who were shy and many harpoon shots away, but because of her desperate predicament. Mia was lost. She had been lost without food for many sleeps on the north slope of Alaska. The barren slopes stretches for 200 miles from the Brooks Range to the Arctic Ocean and for more than 800 miles from Canada to the Chukchi Sea. No roads cross it. Ponds and lakes freckle its immensity. Winds scream across it and the view in every direction is exactly the same. Somewhere in this cosmos was Mia and the very life in her body, its spark and warmth depended upon these wolves for survival and she was not so sure they would help. Mia stared hard at the regal black wolf, hoping to catch his eye. She must somehow tell him that she was starving and ask him for food. This could be done, she knew, for her father, an Eskimo hunter, had done so. One year, he had camped near a wolf den while on a hunt. When a month had passed and her father had seen no game, he told the leader of the wolves that he was hungry and needed food. The next night, the wolf called him from far away, and her father went to him and found a freshly killed caribou. Unfortunately, Mia's father never explained to her how he had told the wolves of his needs, and not long afterward, he paddled his kayak into the Bering Sea to hunt for seal, and he never returned. She had been watching the wolves for two days, trying to discern which of their sounds and movements expressed goodwill and friendship. Most animals had such signals. The little arctic ground squirrels flicked their tails sideways to notify others of their kind that they were friendly. By imitating the signal with her forefinger, Mia had lured many a squirrel to her hand. If she could discover such a gesture for the wolves, she would be able to make friends with them and share their food like a bird or fox. Propped on her elbows with her chin in her fist, she stared at the black wolf trying to catch his eye. She had chosen him because he was much larger than the others and because he walked like her father, Kapugan, with his head high and his chest out. The black wolf also possessed wisdom, she had observed. The pack looked to him when the wind carried strange scents or the birds cried nervously. If he was alarmed, they were alarmed. If he was calm, they were calm. Long minutes passed and the black wolf did not look at her. He had ignored her since she first came upon them two sleeps ago. True, she moved slowly and quietly so as not to alarm him, yet she did wish he would see the kindness in her eyes. Many animals could tell the difference between hostile hunters and friendly people by merely looking at them, but the big black wolf would not even glance her way. 
A bird stretched in the grass. The wolf looked at it. A flower twisted in the wind. He glanced at that. Then the breeze rippled the wolverine rough on Mia's parka, and it glistened in the light. He did not look at that. She waited. Patience with the ways of nature had been instilled in her by her father, and so she knew better than to move or shout, yet she must get food or die. Her hand shook slightly, and she swallowed hard to keep calm. Mia was a classic Eskimo beauty, small of bone and delicately wired with strong muscles. Her face was pearl round and her nose was flat. Her black eyes, which slanted gracefully, were moist and sparkling. Like the beautifully formed polar bears and foxes of the north, she was slightly short-limbed. The frigid environment of the Arctic had sculptured life into compact shapes. Unlike the long-limbed, long-bodied animals of the south that are cooled by dispensing heat on extended surfaces, all living things in the Arctic tend toward compactness to conserve heat. The length of her limbs and the beauty of her face were of no use to Mia as she lay on the lichen-speckled frost heave in the middle of the bleak tundra. Her stomach ached and the royal black wolf was carefully ignoring her. Amarak! Elia! Wolf! My friend! She finally called. Look at me! Look at me! She spoke half in Eskimo and half in English as if the instincts of her father and the science of the Gussics, the white-faced might evoke some magical combination that would help her get her message through to the wolf. Amarok glanced at his paw and slowly turned his head her way without lifting his eyes. He licked his shoulder. A few matted hairs sprang apart and twinkled individually. Then his eyes sped to each of the three adult wolves that made up his pack and finally to the five pups who were sleeping in a fuzzy mass near the den entrance. The great wolf's eyes softened at the sight of the little wolves, then quickly hardened into brittle yellow jewels as he scanned the flat tundra. Not a tree grew anywhere to break the monotony of the gold-green plain, for the soils of the tundra are permanently frozen. Only moss, grass, lichens, and a few hardy flowers take root in the thin upper layer that thaws briefly in summer. Nor do many species of animals live in this rigorous land. But those creatures that dwell here exist in bountiful numbers. Amarok watched a large cloud of Lapland's long spurs wheel up into the sky, then alight in the grasses. Swarms of crane flies, one of the few insects that can survive the cold, darkened the tips of the mosses. Birds wheeled, turned, and called. Thousands sprang up from the ground like leaves in a wind. The wolf's ears cupped forward and turned in on some distant message from the tundra. Mia tensed and listened, too. Did he hear some brewing storm, some approaching enemy? Apparently not. His ears relaxed and he rolled to his side. She sighed, glancing at the vaulting sky and was painfully aware of her predicament. Here she was, watching wolves. She, Mia, daughter of Kapugan, adopted child of Martha, citizen of the United States, pupil at the Bureau of Indian Affairs School in Barrow, Alaska, and 13-year-old wife of the boy Daniel. She shivered at the thought of Daniel, for it was he who had driven her to this fate. She had run away from him exactly seven sleeps ago, and because of this, she had one more title by Gussick's standards, the child divorcee. The wolf rolled rolled to his belly. Amarak, she whispered, I am lost and the sun will not set for a month. There is no north star to guide me. Amarak did not stir. And there are no berry bushes here to bend under the polar wind and point to the south, nor are there any birds I can follow, she looked up. Here, the birds are buntings and long spurs. They do not fly to the sea twice a day like the puffins and sandpipers that my father followed. The wolf groomed his chest with his tongue. I never dreamed I could get lost, Amarak, she went on, talking out loud to ease her fear. At home on Nunavik Island, where I was born, the plants and birds pointed the way for wanderers. I thought they did so everywhere, and so, great black Amarok, I am without a compass. So we hope you read the rest of this story on Hoopla. Thank you.